Hello and welcome to the Miami Chauvin Peace Centre online, the home of truth and reconciliation platform. Today we begin a series of discussions entitled Speaking for Myself, where our guest panellists will give their own personal opinions and reaction to the testimonies of the witnesses we are about to hear. Our witnesses today are Joe Campbell and Alan McBride, and our panellists are Pat Hines and Amy O'Neill, and our great friend, TARP colleague and TARP co-founder is Eugene Reevy. He's up there in White Cross in County Armagh, and Eugene will keep an eye on the proceedings. The theme today uh, is, can there be reconciliation without truth? And we'll begin with a witness impact statement from Alan McBride. And as it is our stated policy of TARP, the witness will speak entirely for themselves. So uh, you're welcome, Alan. Hi, uh, okay, well, thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, and uh, hi to all the, uh, to Joe and various people that are, that are tuning in. Uh, so I have nothing prepared uh, in terms of a prepared statement, but can I start by saying, uh, just the title, and I mean, I've spoken about this several times, and I know that uh, certainly uh, I, I think I, it, there would be a wee bit of a disagreement around the, the, around TARP and, and some of these issues. Um, I fundamentally believe uh, that there can be reconciliation without truth, and I'll, I'll tell you for a why. Um, I don't believe that we're going to get um, full truth in Northern Ireland. I think we might get parts of it, um, but I think largely um it will be hidden and I, I say that because i've been working in this uh sector uh for a number of years and i'll tell my own story um which also includes a number a number of mistruths uh that have been uh fed over the years uh and that has had a, a huge impact on me and my family but the reason i say that reconciliation is possible with the truth is because i have spent the last 20 years of my life uh really living breathing uh working for reconciliation and if I thought that it was predicated on having to have the truth, uh, well, then I would have to say to you that I don't believe that reconciliation will ever be possible. And so therefore, there would be no point in me continuing uh, the work that I do. Um, I, I, I do think that people have to come to a place in their lives, however, where they're, where they're able to, uh, to let go of very, very difficult uh, things that happened in the past. And there's no doubt about this. And this is where I am in complete agreement uh, with my colleagues. Uh, on TARP. Uh, certainly if families got answers to the questions that they have, there's no doubt that that would help them further along that road. But the question still remains to be uh, answered, uh, that if people don't have the full truth, as I suspect they won't, uh, well then what does that mean uh, for reconciliation? And to be honest with you, I think our society is completely, um, uh, you know, not reconcilable um if, if that's if that's the case so i just want to set out those few introductory comments uh before i start uh my own story so so my wife was 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 murdered uh on the shankle road in belfast um in 1993 uh she was just a young woman uh working in her father's fish shop business that's where she was on a saturday and the ira came onto the road that day uh and left a bomb in the counter and murdered uh, her and uh, eight other civilians and also one of the bombers died at the scene as well. Um, I mean, I think it's widely reported that there was supposed to be a meeting that day of UDA personnel uh, that happened to have the, uh, the shop just above, or happened to have the premises just above the fish shop. And I think one of the, the, the great sadnesses of actually working um, and living in Northern Ireland uh, is that you just took uh, the troubles for granted. You know, you just kind of, they, they became acceptable. You never really questioned uh you know the things that you did and so if somebody had told us whenever we uh my father-in-law bought the shop in the 80s that look this is below the uda headquarters and it's probably always going to be a target um it's probably not the best place to have a shop um you know if somebody had sat down with us and had that conversation we might well have agreed and not had the shop there but nobody ever had that conversation certainly we didn't ever think that this would be a target because we were just complacent about the the risk it was all around us but that look ran out on the 23rd of october when the ira come onto the come onto the road and blew the the shop up on the pretense of trying to get uh, to the UDA men. What I do know is that there was no UDA men meeting that day. Uh, there is some rumours, and certainly these were circulating in the Irish news um, uh, a few years ago, that the IRA got a tip off uh, that there was going to be a bomb, and so or, sorry, the, sorry, the UDA got a tip off that there was going to be a bomb, and so they never had their meeting that day. I have no idea if that's true or not. What I will say is that I've, I've, I have looked into it with some journalist friends, and uh, we met with the chief constable at the time. And there's absolutely no evidence to support that theory. Um, and so I have uh, widely discounted it. 
um, because to be honest with you, uh, facing up to the you know to to, to the pretense or to a half truth that uh, the UDA might have got a tip off just takes you into a place where I don't really want to go in relation to well if they got the tip off why why wasn't uh, my wife's father informed seeing as how she owned the shop below the UDA headquarters there's absolutely no evidence to support it um, so I, I went on then uh, a very angry uh, place for a while uh, campaigning for um, uh, not so much justice uh, and truth because I think I knew what happened and I certainly uh, we, we got a, a person convicted of the Shankle bomb I mean obviously there was others that weren't convicted, the driver and uh, people who planned the operation were never convicted and brought before the courts. So I have a, a rough idea who some of those people are, um, but they were never ever appeared before a court. So for a while, um, I had campaigned, uh, just wanting to get my story out. And I suppose over the years, um, I kind of mellowed a bit and I kind of realized that, you know, staying in that angry place was probably affecting me more than it was affecting uh, the people that I was angry at. And so I had to come to a place in my own life where I sort of sat down and, and thought about, you know, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And it's then that I started to think about my upbringing. My father was a member of the UDA when I was growing up. I grew up in a loyalist housing estate. Uh, my upbringing was quite sectarian. I didn't really know very many Catholics um, at the time, in spite of the fact that my sister had married one uh, in the um, uh, late seventies, but they moved in, or sorry, the early seventies, but they then moved to Australia. Um, so I, I suppose I went through this transformation um, and I had a moment in, and this is the kind of hitchhiker's guide to my story, I can sort of talk for an hour. Um, uh, I had this uh, moment in Edinburgh where I was actually confronted uh, by um, uh, being in the same place as an IRA man. And we had a conversation and he, he more or less apologised for the shank bomb. He didn't carry it out, but he basically admitted to me that it was wrong and he acknowledged that it was wrong. <clears throat> and I think for me, well, he didn't give me any more truth. About the, about the situation, but he certainly helped me to be able to, uh, to move on with my life. And so I kind of wonder sometimes when we're thinking about the past and, uh, and all of these things, and obviously colleagues can speak for themselves, you know, uh, when we start to look at truth, uh, you know, and, and the truth of what happened and who did what to who, and, and, and so what does truth mean and, and what are people looking for when they say they're looking for the truth? To me, uh, the acknowledgement that uh, somebody was saying that it was wrong and it shouldn't have happened uh, was enough to make me uh, go on and, and start to do very different things with my life. And so instead of campaigning uh, outside Sinn Féin offices and being in that very angry place, I, um, I, I started to sit down with people who I was formerly shouting at, Sinn Féin activists and IRA people and loyalists and what have you. Um, and I started to develop an understanding. That understanding, I have to say to you, has never brought me to the place where I'm able to say, well, that was okay. It was never okay. And I, to my dying day, will say that the conflict in Northern Ireland was hugely preventable. It wasn't inevitable. Um, you know, violence is never inevitable. Um, you know, peace is always the better way. Um, I think sometimes people turn to violence uh, when they get desperate or sometimes they're manipulated by people with other agendas. Um, but the violence uh, uh, is really never inevitable and I, and I will continue um, to say that. So the work I do today is very much about developing peace and reconciliation. It's developing peace and reconciliation in that vacuum on many occasions of the truth not being known. Uh, but this idea that we have to have the truth before we can have reconciliation, I would have to put it um, to the panel, uh, it means that we will never have reconciliation because I don't ever believe that we will get full truth. I hope and I pray that, that, that you will get answers to some of your questions, but the notion that you will get answers to all of your questions, um, it has never happened in any society that has come out of conflict in the world and I don't suspect it's going to happen here either. Um, so I, I'll maybe just park it there. Thanks very much uh, for that, Alan. We'll we'll hand over to straight away to Joe to Joe Campbell. Uh, Joe, whenever you're ready. Uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to to tell what is me and my family's story, and I think I would uh, say that I think all of us who are involved in the work that we do have a massive hope that there can be reconciliation and I think from some of the events that we have done and lots of the people that we have met I, I do believe that reconciliation is possible but I also believe that there should be a massive effort by all parties who were involved in the conflict uh, to give people as much truth as they can so I've, I've done it a different way and I've just prepared uh, a witness statement so if you don't mind I'll just read that for you. 
A terrible evil has visited us here. Uh, those were the words of Monsignor Mullally, a requiem mass from my father, Sergeant Joe Campbell, who was murdered on the 25th of February, 1977, in Christendall, County Antrim, by the notorious loyalist assassin, Robin Jackson, also known as the Jackal. Jackson murdered over 100 people and was convicted of not one of those murders. How was that possible? Six weeks after my father's murder, William Strathairn was murdered in a hochel just outside of Ballymena. And at his trial, when sentencing two of those involved, RUC officers Billy McCaughey and John Weir, the judge, Lowry, who went on to become the Lord Chief Justice, said, but your actions were understandable, they were unforgivable. I just, you know, many people have reflected on that statement uh, from that day. During the trial, when asked why Jackson was not in the dock, also facing a murder charge, RUC officer Cecil West replied, operational strategy. Again, people have reflected from the day of the trial about what that actually meant. My grandfather uh, was a sergeant in the uh, Southern Police Force in Garda Shikona, and he was based in Scotstown and in County Monaghan with his family. And it was from that home that my father and his brother set off on their bicycles to Monaghan Town to join the guards. The guards had an embargo on recruitment at that time, uh, so dad and his brother went home and then cycled out the other road across the border uh, to Enniskillen, where they joined the RUC. After postings in Money Moor and Cross McLean, our family settled in a little part of heaven known as Cushendall in the Glens of Andrew. Uh, just to say, with regard to Cross McGlen, when my father was moved from Cross McGlen, the local independent nationalist councillor, a fellow called Eddie Richardson, got a, uh, 1,700 signatures together to request that my father remain in post in Cross McGlen. On the day of his murder, my father was off duty uh, uh, when he was lured to the police station by a phone call from a fellow officer where he was shot in the back of the head uh, from close range. I believe if my father hadn't gone to the station uh, that evening, the gang would have come to the house where my mother and most of us eight children were. The people who took the decision to murder my father were well aware of the enormity of their actions. When murdering a Catholic RUC sergeant against the backdrop of 50% of the population, i.e. Catholics not giving support to the RUC. That all of the guilty of the crime feel they could never be pursued because my father was only a Catholic. Did his religion make him disposable? So the question is, why was he killed? Well, he had discovered that senior RUC officers colluded with loyalist terrorists to commit serious crimes, including murder and illegal importation of uh, large amounts of arms. There were two police investigations yet there were no convictions nor any confirmation of why my father was murdered. Police Ombudsman investigation, which lasted 12 years, also did not contain a full account of the murder that my family had for. My mom, while my mother and family remain unhappy about this, uh, we welcomed the, those elements of the report which highlighted incriminating evidence of RUC failures before and after the murder. These failures included the deliberate concealment and destruction of crucial documents, such as the original murder investigation file, sensitive uh, intelligence reports were destroyed, interview notes with suspects were destroyed, and there was a disappearance of a logbook from an RUC armory. And also the fact that many senior RUC officers refused to cooperate with the investigation. The RUC Chief Constable in office on the day of the murder, Sir Kenneth Newman, who went on to become Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, said, we did not remember, he did not remember the case. And that was somewhat surprising, given that he told my mother in 1980, in his private quarters in RUC headquarters, that two members of his own force were at that time being questioned about the murder. All of this has encouraged me uh, and others to complete the search for 
it was the RU, that the RUC went to great uh, lengths to bury. After 43 years, no, no official is able or willing to tell my 85-year-old mother who it was who murdered her husband or the reason why he was killed. The murder itself has had a profound effect on the family and the wider community. Um, the problem that those who want to close down the past do not seem to understand is that for those of us who've suffered grievous wrong and been affected by the most serious crimes, what happened to us, it remains part of the present. For many victims and survivors, they live through those events every single day of their lives. And I think we must remember that an absence of truth is not just a lie told to be forgotten, it's a generational thing. Um, I think what we have to remember with extreme politics being seen across the world at the moment, it's appropriate to remember the words of uh, Martin Niemöller's. First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I was not a Jew, so I did not speak. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak for me. My family were left with no option really after all the official investigations, but to seek legal recourse against the PSNI. And 15 years later, we're still awaiting a day in court. 43 years on from my father's murder, we're still awaiting a proper inquest into his death. History, I think history shows us that eventually countries which have emerged from conflict, as the North has, we just have to deal with the past. Wrongdoing, and hurt suffered has to be acknowledged. There absolutely has to be a recognition that everyone is subject to the rule of law. On that basis, a new solid foundation will emerge and a more sustainable future can be built. Victims and survivors need multiple solutions to the problems of the past. Solutions that recognize pain, which allow stories to be told, which provide support, through a pension for those terrible injuries, both physical and mental, that have not been properly looked after by the state. We also need support for carers, and we need an independent, transparent, accountable investigative process, which will bring before the law those who can be made accountable, and which will tell as much as can be told about the deaths that happened during the Troubles. No matter what embarrassment or inconvenience that may cause anyone or any government. Thanks very much for that, Joe. Um, before we hand over to, um, to our panellists, if I can just sum up my uh, understanding of what uh, uh, both Alan and Joe have said there. Alan says that uh, truth, or at least you did say the full truth, is not possible. As opposed to that, Joe says that the, uh, the important truths, those uh, truths that are being withheld by the authorities, it is possible to get those truths. Uh, so the question was that, is reconciliation possible without truth? We didn't say without the full truth. So perhaps there's some kind of meeting in the, in the middle here. That, as I say, uh, Joe says that there are truths that are being withheld by those in, in authority and that that is possible. So um, I'll ask uh, you, Pat, Pat Hines from the Glen Cree um, Centre for Peace and Reconciliation. Pat, what's your take on that? Do we need the full truth before we get reconciliation or can we have reconciliation without any truth? So first of all, let me say um, thank you very much to, to you and to Eugene and to all the others, Joe included and Alan for allowing me to participate in this. Um, so I'm Pat Hines from the Glen Cree Centre for Peace and Reconciliation. Um, I don't normally do uh, events like this. Much of my work is uh, 
is of a, a private nature. Um, I'm responsible for political dialogue and legacy related matters at the center. Um, and I've worked for much of the last number of years, teasing through many of the questions that have been raised here this evening. Um, perhaps I suppose to begin, um, the morass or the, the mess that we find ourselves in, in terms of emerging from what was uh, a very, very uh, dark conflict uh, is, is clear and evidential in the testimonies that you've heard previously. Um, and I suppose I do want to acknowledge what Alan uh, and in a different way Joe has said, um, all of us on the island and indeed the islands of Ireland and Britain uh, share a common history, but we don't share a common memory. So we remember those events very differently. Um, and that has been a huge challenge for me as I've tried to mediate many of these conversations. Um, so people's memory of the past is very different from what many others will believe are the facts of the past or the actual history of it. Um, so in terms of the question itself, um, it, is, it is fraught with difficulty um, because in many ways uh, you are trying to get answers to questions. Um, in some cases, they're not available. In some cases, some people don't want to either delve into them or they can't. Um, and in so far as you can, uh, it's, if it's possible, and if it is, in a sense, cathartic and people wish to enter into processes looking for answers, um, I think, as Alan uh, has said, you're probably faced with the reality in large part that you're going to get a portion of the answer or the answers um, framed in a particular way uh, around people's memory of the past, not necessarily with any uh, rigor, uh, but their memory of it. I think what has been said previously is much more important in that any process, and of course Stormont House was the agreed structure by the two governments and the five parties uh, to go into this and in as best a way we could um, tease out these, these issues. If we could create circumstances where people would genuinely acknowledge that what happened was wrong and, and acknowledge that the hurt and the pain and the violence that characterized our history for 25 years uh, in a divided society only made the problem worse. I think that would go a huge distance uh, in addressing a lot of the hurt and pain that many individuals feel. Uh, I think what a lot of people uh, find impossible to deal with are emerging narratives which run counter to the hurt and pain that they feel every day. And when I listen to Alan, I listen to Joe and other people, and I've listened to you and Eugene many times, uh, the events of, we take, you know, Miami 45 years ago, or in Joe's case, 43 years ago, or in Alan's case, you know, 20, 27 years ago. Um, they, they, they're, they're, they're really in minutes terms. You can reduce those to minutes and they're relived every day. Uh, so 45 years is in fact 45 minutes for those who feel the pain and have no answers to the searching questions that they have had for all of these years. So I think the kind of process that we need to, to embark upon, if it can be, uh, designed uh, is, is a process where you get acknowledgement that what was done was wrong. And in so far as you can get answers that satisfy to some extent the victims of these terrible atrocities, um, I think that's probably the best that we can hope for. Whether that you know, can be defined in absolute terms by a full answer, a partial answer, I think only the victims themselves can can really respond to that and give an indication that a process has been sufficient in answering the questions they've had and then acknowledging their afterwards. So there's my five minutes. Well, Pat, can I just ask you that when you say that acknowledgement as opposed to truth, is that a substitute for truth? No, but I, I, I think what we've got to do 
um, I think answers to questions um, if framed in the wrong way towards the victim of an atrocity can be more harmful. But I think if somebody is genuinely going to acknowledge that the impact uh, of what occurred uh, in the life of the victims, I think that can have a much more profound effect. And as Alan has indicated in his experience, um, if, if you acknowledge that the violence was wrong, um, I, I think, and the violence that caused so much damage uh, and trauma that we live with today, um, I, I, I think that would go much, much further, not as a substitute, but I almost think it's, it's as important, if not more important. I, I, I don't think it necessarily is, is of advantage or benefit if somebody comes in and gives a set of answers within a, a particular approach and does not acknowledge that the incident that occurred and that so adversely affected someone's life wasn't wrong. Before I go over to, to Amy, I'd just like you to clarify something there, Pat. There, there are gray areas, and uh, for instance, where a lack of truth, a, a lack of whether we call it acknowledgement or truth, acknowledgement uh, in this in certain cases wouldn't be sufficient. If, for instance, when somebody's blamed in the wrong or when they are on the record as being guilty of something, say for instance, all of those years there was a there was a um, a big cloud over over Derry and the Bloody Sunday and. Uh, cases such as uh, McGurk's Bar and in cases like Eugene's where he needs the absolute, uh, not just an acknowledgement, but uh, he needs people to come up and say, you know, what what he was accused of is wrong, uh, it was completely wrong, And but his, uh, his suffering continues and the suffering of people like McGurk's Bar continues until the, the absolute truth comes out there. Anyway, we'll, we'll, thanks for that, Pat. We'll hand over to Amy O'Neill. Amy is, uh, uh, has her own story to tell because uh, she's been, uh, she was a victim herself, but tonight she's a panelist, but uh, a victim of the, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, I think. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I also wanted to thank you for allowing me to listen to your stories and, um, be a part of this conversation today because I agree with, with you, Stephen, in the platform that storytelling is such an important part of healing when it comes to surviving a traumatic event of any kind. Um, I certainly don't know what it's like to live through um, the atrocities that you've experienced in Northern Ireland, but I do understand what it's like to be a victim and a survivor of um, a terrorist attack. One of the things that strikes me about reconciliation or truth or acknowledgement, and I, the words are sort of finding their place in this story, there is a common theme amongst victims and survivors that recognition and validation for the personal experience is a central experience for healing. And I don't know that that necessarily means truth, always, for me at least, and reconciliation I had the experience of going through a trial and being present at the formal sentencing for um, one of the Sarnoff, the surviving Sarnoff brother who was our attacker. And I, I, I can honestly say that although going through the process of the trial provided some healing opportunity, that isn't what made me find peace with my experience in the end. It still didn't make sense to me why somebody would do what they do or why he did what he did and how he became the person he was that was capable of putting a pressure cooker bomb on a sidewalk full of people running a marathon. It makes no sense. Um, one of the things I'm hearing that I relate to is the, 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 the trauma experience. And Joe, you mentioned it. It's, it's the past is alive in you today because that's what trauma is it's the past being alive in you. And our job as survivors is to figure out how we're gonna carry our past in the present because it becomes a part of your story. It becomes a part of you forever. But how do you carry your past in your present where it doesn't continue to cause ongoing injury and steal your joy of the moment? And this 
generational trauma that you're dealing with in your in Ireland is is another really important topic to talk about because the wounds that aren't healed that get passed down from generation to generation stay alive and impact the way that we live our lives on a on a daily basis. One of the things that the trial did provide is an opportunity to connect with other survivors and other people that have gone through this experience. Part of the validation that I got was hearing somebody else's story being able to listen to them and, and have it begin to make sense of what my story was. I could hear somebody else talk about something that language made sense to me. It helped me put together something I was feeling. It helped me identify something I didn't know was, was happening to me. And then eventually I collected as many pieces as I could and tried to put them together into a story or into a narrative that helped me make sense of my experience, which really is independent, I think, from the healing of the trauma is separate, I think, from the, the truth and the reconciliation. The themes that survivors from around the world talk about, validation, recognition, access to justice, compensation, people from all over the world talk about the same things. I think part of what we often feel is if that happens, then I will start to feel more peace. If that happens, then I will move through that part of my experience. And if that happens, then this feeling that I have in the present will go away. I, I don't, that's a real experience for every, every survivor, but for some people that, that may be enough and for some people it won't be. For some people, the healing is gonna be a, around the way that you carry your trauma in the present. Um, loneliness I, and shame. I think are central themes. I feel I connected to people like Joe and Eugene when you meet them because there's something that we all carry in the present that we see in each other that's so familiar that it makes it comfortable and safe to connect to that person. So the connections that you have with people become part of how we heal, sharing the stories, being willing to promote peace despite you know, not quite having the truth that you're looking for, um, and in terms of moving on, and I don't like the term moving on, I think that we figure out how to move forward. It's a part of you, it's a part of your story, it changes the trajectory of our lives. Um, Dr. Alyssa Reingold, who's somebody that um, we do some work with at our Mass Violence and Victimization Resource Center here in the United States, she talks about learning how to carry our grief lightly, because we're not putting it down. So what, what we want to do is, is learn how to carry it lightly and have opportunities to feel more alive in the present and less impacted by our past. Um, one of the, uh, the terrible things that happens uh, when you become a victim, or at least when you uh, acknowledge the fact, unlike uh, for years and years, I decided that I wasn't a victim, I was a survivor, but um, had an experience where I had to uh, except that I was a victim. One of the terrible things that accompanies being a victim is a lack of self-worth. Um, you feel that there's a, some kind of defeat and you look for some way of trying to give yourself uh, a sense of value again. And I think all of the people that I've worked with in TARP, uh, that, that Eugene and I continually work with in TARP, that they feel some sense of um, I won't say satisfaction, but they feel that they've done something good when they stand on a platform and say, you know, this has been my experience. What kind of value do you put on the testimony uh, of the victim, Amy? Testimony of the victim is central, central to healing, not only for the, the victim or the survivor. And I, 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 under, I relate to that having to come to terms with being a victim I went through that as well. Um, standing on a platform and telling your story gives us an opportunity to hopefully, survivors are very generous with their private pain that they carry. One, because we know that it's gonna help somebody else. Two, I think through helping others, we, we help to make sense of our own stories and help ourselves. Um, I, we are reflections of each other. I think we see our stories in each other when we share them. 
there's something I see in you that makes sense to me. When you talk about trauma and what it's like to be victimized, there's a shattering that happens inside of you. That shame, that not knowing how to think about it, how to feel about it, what I did, what I didn't do, why didn't I do that, how come this happened to me, there's something that gets put back together a little bit through each connection that you make from sharing your story or having somebody else share their story with you. And it just becomes really powerful in healing. Go back. Thanks, Amy. We go back to, to Alan. Alan, um, is there anything that you've heard uh, from any of the, either the panelists or the witnesses tonight that makes you think differently? Or are you still convinced that? Um, that there can be reconciliation without truth or do we need at least uh, an effort to try to get that truth or whatever is available to us yeah i mean of course we need an effort to try to get to it and whilst i've been working uh you know in the field of reconciliation for many many years uh, i mean i've also part of that work has also taken me into uh you know areas where i've supported families right to know i mean i've worked very closely for a number of years with the bally murphy families who um uh, i've spoken at a number of, of gatherings i'm actually working uh at the minute uh with a a guy who uh lost his father uh, in the dublin bombing and he was only four when he himself was very badly injured and i mean i know um what what his i know what the, the search for peace um and search for truth has done has done for him over the years you know and he's now uh, approaching his 50th year and um you know he's he's, he's been in a very dark place um, but he's still no further on uh, to getting the truth. So I, 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 I hear what people are saying. And uh, listen, I have the utmost respect for all of you and the utmost uh, I mean, empathy and sympathy for, for all of you. And if, if, if you could get answers to the questions you have, you I mean, absolutely. And we can get a process that delivers that. Well, then, of course, uh, we should try that. So I don't think I would ever uh, criticize anybody for, for trying to get to it. Um, but I think that there comes a time when, you know, we have to think about society and about the society we're trying to create. And, and what if uh, those answers are always going to be uh, evasive? Um, every year that's lost is another year, you know, that uh, you're further away from getting the truth. People are, are dying off that were uh, alive and could have given you answers to certain questions, you know, so the... The, 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 that evidentiary trail is, is getting less and less and less. And I, I just don't want to concede defeat to say that, you know, the new society that we're trying to build here um, will never be free unless we have this uh, outpouring of, of truth. So yes, of course, get truth where you can. Um, but I mean, I suppose Stephen as well, in answering your question, I, I, and, and you did say at the start that really, all we can do is speak to our own experiences on this and i think that's that's very very important uh because the journey that i've been on uh you know i i, I respect that other people have been on a very different journey and to be quite honest with you I'm, I'm talking about truth when i have had a person responsible for my wife's murder serve time in prison one of the guys was killed i know that there are people here that that, that have never had that and probably will never get that and so I'm, I'm i'm in a different place in some respects so maybe you know uh it's easy for me to say these things because i've had a relative closure haven't had everything again you may not get everything but i have had some things um but i have to say that you know i mean in terms of the people that i've sat down and, and met with and i mean i've sat down with some people that have done some very nasty things uh some very nasty things you know and sometimes i don't really want to know what they've done because i don't want it to affect the way i relate to them because i met them at a certain I mean, one of my best friends is a uh is an ira guy uh that i would go and i would stay in his house frequently uh i i have never asked or never googled or never tried to find out uh what he did um because i don't want it to uh impact upon how i would think of him uh, i met him at a certain time in his life and um he's very committed these days to the peace process i don't suspect that he um regrets what he did um we've never had that conversation but i i, I very seldom meet people in paramilitary organizations who are going to come and and, and tell you that you know look we regret getting involved in the conflict um i mean they believe 
Um, and I, to go back to Pat's point, you know, I mean, where I, I got that acknowledgement for that IRA guy that what happened on the Shackle Road was wrong. Um, and he was able to say that he, he, he told me it was wrong militarily. He told me it was wrong morally. It was wrong ethically. Um, but he himself was involved in other things that he wouldn't apologize for because he believed that, you know, uh, you know, and so, so that, that, that's part of this equation as well. And in an ideal world, of course, you would have people coming forward and telling you everything and begging for forgiveness. Uh, but that's not the world we live in. And uh, if we're serious about doubling reconciliation, I think sometimes some of us just have to let go a wee bit. And uh, I, I know that's hard. It's really hard. And I feel for every one of you, um, you know, Joe and Eugene, you, Stephen, you know, um, what you've been through. Um, I don't really know you, Amy, but I mean, I feel for your, 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 your hurt that, that, that happened in the Boston Marathon. Um, and so, so it, 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 you know, I, all you can do is be responsible for yourself. I, I just want to be a person that just lives and the life that I live is, is, is one of, of peace loving and reconciliation. And I'll, I'll go anywhere. I'll sit down with anybody. I'll talk to anyone. I mean, I've been in uh, McGabry talking to dissident Republicans. Uh, in fact, a young man actually that I befriended in there um, told me that he was uh, 18 when he got involved with the real IRA. And uh, he was caught gun running. And uh, when he looked, when he came out, he looked me up. And me and him had a cup of coffee down in um, in the centre of town. I got him help through Cloister at the time because my friend worked for Cloister. And then I realised that uh, that he'd got reinvolved again. And next thing I seen him on the TV, and he was actually a spokesperson for for this organisation. You know, and I sort of felt he, he'd been duping me. But you know, I think I would rather be naive as cynical. Um, uh, you know, when you go along, and I mean, sometimes you get your you, you do get your your your, your hands burnt or whatever you know but uh yeah that's that's where i'm coming from you do wonderful work uh, pat before i go over to to joe um we we speak about the uh, uh turning our lives around in 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 the case of the victims that they can find uh, a use for themselves and, and uh get self-worth back again is there a case to be made for former uh combatants paramilitaries people who were had been jailed or whatever do they have something to offer too? Uh, they're on a journey and clearly they must learn something too. Uh, as far as I know that the vast majority of the older people have uh, a desire not to see conflict resume again. I mean, peace processes and um, political processes um, are messy. When you're trying to um, create pathways for former violent organizations um, to get into politics and get into the acceptance of, you know, democratic norms and so on. That is a slow and uh, tedious process, it's not least for those within those organizations who, um, for the most part, at least at the outset of such a journey, have very little time for politics or democratic norms as most people would understand them. Um, I mean, I think we have seen over the course of the last 25 years many uh, advances uh, in terms of the journey that former paramilitary organizations have made um, in changing the, the nature of their involvement in society, first by ending the violence and then by many of them playing an active role in advancing the peace process and the aims of the peace process. Um, I think that one of the most difficult things and one of the, um, I suppose, big challenges up ahead for them is, um, is in the context of answering the question about uh, the violence. Um, and as I suppose my, my great hero, John Hume, and, and, and along with him, Seamus Mallon, who constantly said, in a divided society, violence will only make the problem worse and history had taught us our own irish history had taught us that violence had only deepened the problem and the divisions and if we're to ease uh, those divisions and create an ever sense or an ever deeper sense of reconciliation then there is a role for former combatants i think to engage with victims um, and to the extent that they can as alan has already alluded to to the extent that they can answer some of the questions, but I think more fundamentally to leave um, those who have 
suffered most grievously as a consequence of the con conflict um, and then wider society, a commitment that we would never return to that again. And, and, and that that practice of that violence was wrong. And I recall the moments on the documentary where you had met the organizations that were responsible for your own incident, Stephen, and, and your absolute desire with clarity to establish from them that the violence of the past had no place in the politics of the future. And I think that was an important moment and that if we could see more of that, it would be, I think it would be an important development. Uh, Joe, um, you're on a, a journey and it's, uh, it's quite intense because uh, you've, you've got a court case and I know that uh, looking at, at Sarah there, your sister and your cousin Kev, that uh, th there is, there is uh, an urgency and an intensity, I, I know that from talking to you on a regular basis. Would you be happy um, or do you think that there is a role somewhere f where the former combatants from former uh, paramilitaries or people say even people that you hold responsible uh, would you accept that there would be a role for them to play in in at the resolution to your to your problems uh, absolutely Stephen. Uh, i've always said that um i think in, in relation to the legal action that we have you know, if the authorities had told us the truth, uh, 43 years, 40 years, 30, 35 years, 20 years ago, I'd have closed my books and walked away from it. If we'd got that acknowledgement and the truth back then, it's the, I think it's the knowledge and the disappointment and the hurt that was, that, that what, what was visited on our, our family and our community was done by the authorities and that was very difficult to take given that my father had played a role in trying to make a better society you know through the job and he took big chances in the job when he joined the the RUC um, and I, I think ex-combatants have got, got, got a place and as Alan says sometimes you get your fingers burned that's not the way I would describe it but Alan would have more experience in that than me and talking next competence, but I spoke to a lot of the guys who who were were involved in, in my father's case, and um, you can't exclude people. Uh, so, because if you believe in reconciliation, I think you have to believe that everybody has a part to play in that. I think one of the biggest mistakes that that was made in the society was back when the peace process was signed that survivors and victims were largely excluded from that and how those issues would be dealt with going forward. I think we're paying for that now. There's lots of different survivors and victims individually and groups out there are looking for different things. I know WAVE are pushing hard for the pension. That should absolutely be granted in the morning. And it's sad to see that politicians don't have the humanity to do that. To do, to do it immediately but I think that's one of the issues with regard to the truth because when you've got politicians who in some shape or form are either involved in or agree with some of the things that happened and they're sitting down on a table opposite each other and they can't agree on things and when there's a disagreement, it reverts back to the lowest common denominator. Well, you know, we know what you did and usings are as bad and it's always usings and usings and lemons. And I think when you get, you know, if you put the truth on the table for everybody, there's nowhere to hide then. You can't hide behind those slogans and, and criticisms of other people because everybody knows what happened. It was bad. We know the truth. Let's put that behind us and let's go forward because I think you need to have respect with each other. And I don't think largely today that all of the politicians have got that. And that's an issue for the society going forward. Thanks, Stephen, I'm going to have to pop on. I'm sure. going to have to have to get this quiz to go. But guys, listen, it's been uh, delightful. Um, I wish you well with it. Uh, I hope that my comments have been uh, helpful. Uh, and that uh, we we'll keep working together. You know, we don't disagree on an awful lot. Um, I, I think we're 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 absolutely, you know, committed to truth, to peace, to reconciliation, to all of those things. Um, I suppose I just 
think sometimes there comes a time when you have to work out what you've got and is what you've got enough and can you make the best with what you have or do we need more? Where more can be got, we should absolutely go after it. I mean, I have no doubt about that and I wish all of you well. Um, I mean, I have to say just before I do go, uh, not only, of course, did Eugene have the, uh, the absolute horror of losing three of his brothers, but actually to be accused um, of, uh, of, of an atrocity uh, that happened also just the, the following day. Uh, I think is a, is a truth that, 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 that is easy to, 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 to rectify and to write. Um, I mean, it has been rated, uh, but of course, uh, with Paisley and all of that, Eugene, and I really do feel for that. And uh, I think about that often, um, uh, you know, that, that he got away with saying that. Um, uh, but I mean, there, I think there are some things that you just need to press on for. And when a man's reputation is, uh, is, has been, you know, so, so I'll, I'll finish with that. Lovely meeting you all. And, uh, I wish you well. We'll okay. talk to you. We'll talk to you soon, Alan. Alan. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. Bye-bye. Eugene, you've been listening to, um, to Joe and to Alan and Amy, uh, who wears two hats here. One is a victim and, and also as somebody who's working with victims to help them. And of course, Pat. And whereas there's no such thing as a, there shouldn't be at least a hierarchy of victims. I don't know anybody who's suffered like you have. And yet you've got this amazing ability to every single day of your life. I mean, you call me about three, four times a day uh, and we talk about how best to, to, uh, to affect reconciliation. Where do you get the, the, the stamina, the strength, the courage the, to, to continue on, even though your case is not resolved yet? And as Alan rightly pointed out, that, that, that is one thing that really needs the truth. Well... <clears throat> It's a very difficult thing. Like, I've been listening to Joe's part and Alan's part, and it, all of us need some sort of, uh, like, there's a word going about called closure, and that doesn't, I don't have that word in my vocabulary, because closure doesn't mean anything to me. If I had all these, answers tomorrow morning I still have lost my three brothers I may I, you know, I may have more peace with myself and a uh, better understanding of, of how this all uh, uh, happened but there's no such a word as closure but as, as I was thinking about earlier on the difference in Joe and the difference in Alan is maybe coping how people cope with this loss in a different way. Now, I think that in my case, my three brothers were murdered. And if the police had it, or the authorities had it said, well, we're sorry for this, or it was our people done this, or something, I possibly could have reconciled myself a lot earlier. But the fact that I opened my mouth and asked and questioned, I brought the wrath of the, the RUC on me. And then, because I dug and dug and spoke to everybody that I could find, I, I feel that I became a thorn in their side. And then they, they started this <clears throat> retribution against me, you know. And for to blame me on that atrocity that, like, that happened on the day after my brothers were shot. Like, I mean, that was an awful thing to do because anybody that knows about Irish politics or, or things like that may happen in Ireland, that was one of the worst tragedies that ever occurred. And like for someone that was never a member of any organization or political party to be blamed for that, it was an awful slur. That was a that was an awful blow. You know, and that came twenty-five or twenty-three years after the after the incident. Like it was a long, long time afterwards. But listen, everybody's makeup is different. And 
if, if you ask me where did I get it, I don't think it was naturally in me, Stephen. I was very angry and I was aggressive and different things, but I could not help but ad admire how my mother dealt with all this and uh, how she could open up her heart to all her neighbours. And as, I, as I've told you before, she prayed every day of her life for the people that, that murdered her sons. And she really, like Aunt and I know about reconciliation, I learned from my mother. I didn't read it in a book. I mean, it's not me that should get any plaudits. I don't need any. It was my mother who should have got recognized because she was the peacemaker and she was she was the one in our house that sort of held it all together. Because my father died, as you know, five years after the atrocity. And even though he was a very strong person, very strong person, and and it was he that, that asked us not to, or to refrain from joining any organization or getting involved. And I suppose that kept us going then. And then the actions of my mother through her generosity of spirit, like it really, really, really impressed me. And I'm sure it, it rubbed off on an, on an awful lot of other people. Because my mother went to every wake in the country. If you, if you lived anywhere about 30 or 40 mile from a, from a White Cross, you got the phone call, uh, usually, I want to go to the wake tonight. And it wouldn't be five minutes or, t or 10 minutes, you should be in for the whole night, but a crack, and you know, and people got a wee bit of strength from that in thinking that, well, there's a woman that lost three of her sons in very tragic circumstances, and she has the time for to come down here and sympathize and, you know, try to comfort us. So I think, I think it was it was from her that I got the inspiration, uh, Stephen. Sarah, sir, your mother um, continues and continues to suffer. Um, how does how does that play play out on you? You see her all the time. You see your mother. I mean, she's a she's a fabulously strong woman, but nobody is that strong that they can they can go through life without feeling this heartache and how did it affect her and how does it continue to affect her the fact that she hasn't got through Stephen I I think my mother um I think mother went through different phases of being able to cope she was a a, a young a young lady herself but she was a widow with eight children and five of those were still at school and then when she was at her most vulnerable, the men behind this led her to believe that her friends, that her neighbours, that the people who were feeding her children when we were out playing, that they were involved. So they planted, they planted seeds of doubt. They, they were quite prepared to let her believe that she was a widow at the hands of people that she believed loved her. And she lived with that truth for, or well, sorry, she was asked to believe that truth for a long time. And then she was given yeah. at different points um, the possibility of some truth in the form of the initial trial, which we all know now to be, you know, a complete uh, pantomime. And it was her constant, it was her constant battle to want to know the truth. And she wasn't asking for anything that's out of this world. She just wanted to know the truth. You know, it's one, it's one thing when your enemies tell you a lie. But when, when people that you, you believe you should trust tell you a lie and perpetrate that lie for so long, I think as the years um, have gone on, my mother is more determined now than ever. To know that truth and she's entitled to it and 
for every avenue that she would wish to explore to find that truth, we're behind her 100%. I do believe we'll, we'll find that truth after she's able to hear it. She's a, she's um, an inspiration to all of us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can, you can't you can't but be inspired. Kevin, I leave the last word to you because you haven't uh, we haven't got round to you at all. It's it's spread through the greater family and to, through obviously through society through the the community. Um, how was your your family your 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 a cousin? How did it impact on you? Does it, is it does it still ripple through the family? Thank you, Stephen. It certainly does. Um, whenever you're part of an extended family, there's certain sort of wings of that family that you're closer to. Uh, the Derry crew and the Cushion Doll crew have always been very, very close. Um, Joe and Sarah's mother and my mother are sisters. Um, as cousins, we have close ties because, you know, at, during school time, the guys would come down to Derry for two weeks and then would head up to Cushendall for the rest of the summer holidays. Because, as Joey said, like Cushendall is a bit of heaven. In fact, I was up there on Saturday. Um, there's a lot of stuff I've learned tonight. Um, a lot of, some stuff I agree with, some I disagree with. You know, you, you talk about, um, was it Alan was saying that, you know, you'll maybe never get all the truth. I believe that even if that is true, which I hope it's not, that, that should never stifle the hope to get all the truth. Um, and, and Derry, obviously, we, we had a collective suffering with the Bloody Sunday atrocity, uh, which still, a lot of people think it's 100% resolved. It really isn't. There's still one person who was named as not being innocent. Um, there's a lot of stuff goes on out there. It's, I think that the process at the minute and what, what I've learned from tonight, there has to be that acknowledgement. Once that acknowledgement comes, it should be followed up immediately, absolutely immediately with the, the pension that it, it's a disgrace that, it's, that, that, it, that it's been held back. And that should then be followed with proper investigation and proper truth. Because while, while there is doubt and while there are lies, that is acting like a cancer, you know, in, in the minds of the people who are directly involved. You know, I can never claim to be directly involved. Joe, Joe and Sarah are the two that's involved in this group. But as you quite rightly said, the ripple does go out and the ripple does affect other people. Um, you spoke about Mount Rosemary. I mean, in our family circle, Rosemary is an absolute hero. What she has gone through with my uncle Joe and all her family circumstances, no woman should ever have to bear that. But more importantly, no woman should ever have to bear that with lies coming from left, right and centre. And I think it's testament to her strength and to the strength and determination of the family. I admire them totally. Thanks very much for that, Kevin. Um... I could go on here forever. We could sit here and we have uh, sat here for, forever um, talking about these things, but we'd have to wind up. So it just remains for me to say uh, thanks very much to everybody who took part in, uh, to our witnesses, Joe Campbell in London, uh, Alan McBride in Belfast, and to our panellists. Um, uh, so Pat, um, thanks for that, and our best, best regards to your mother as well. Um, also to uh, Amy O'Neill between New York and Philadelphia, someplace out there in, 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 in America. And um, special thanks as always to Eugene Reevy. Um, he's been a, an inspiration to me and a great friend. Uh, I, I never stop marveling at his courage and his strength. And also to everybody at TARP that helps us, uh, the producers and the researchers and all the people that uh, give us input. And a very, very special thanks to the Irish Department of Foreign Affairs uh, for assistance with this, with this project. Uh, so until we see you again, um, we'll say please visit us on our brand new website. Uh, it's tarp.ie, T-A-R-P dot I-E. And uh, this event will be 
is being recorded and it'll be online uh, in, within a couple of well, a couple of days. So as I say, until we meet again, stay safe and stay well, and goodbye.